So a very good evening to all of you. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to share some of my experiences. And also at the outset, uh, I would also like to thank the Kerala veterinarians who are doing a very great job. Uh, I happen to be a member of one of the group, which uh, Dr. Suresh, uh, he just put me in that group. And I was, it was amazing experience for me to uh, see the veterinarians doing a lot and lot of good job. So congratulations also to all of you for doing a great job in the field. And uh, uh, I think I missed an opportunity when I was uh, writing that Bibuline Theriogenology book, because had I been in touch with them, I would have uh, gained uh, a lot from them. So with this, uh, uh, I start today's uh, deliberation, the clinical methods in veterinary obstetrics, a problem-based approach. Maybe I have been using some of the uh, pictorials or pictures which were uh, just downloaded from that group. So <laughs> uh, don't be uh, very scary about it. Uh, it. It was a great help to me uh, by that group. Now, obstetrical clinical problems, they start with around mid of pregnancy and continue till parturition. A bovine veterinarian, a bovine veterinary practitioner is one who always comes across dairy cows or buffaloes and their cows. These busy veterinarians never know for sure what the day will bring. While many appointments might be scheduled in advance, an animal emergency on farmer's place or farm can happen at any time. I hear have uh, just shown few of the pictures uh, that I got from that group, the Kerala veterinarians doing a great job even during night hours and even during the tough times of COVID-19. So I congratulate you once again on this great job. Now, uh, the obstetrical problems, they start with gestation and they end with parturition. The gestational problems in cattle and buffalo, uh, which can just put the uh, pregnancy to a high risk, include the hydroelantois, the placental insufficiency, maternal stress, diseases in cattle with poor prognosis, and uh, one very common hypophosphatemia. A pregnant buffalo with hypophosphatemia is likely to be at a high risk. And it is many a times suggested by us to terminate such a pregnancy. The, prenatal examination of the cows has, or prenatal examination of cattle and buffalo has not become very popular as it is in medical practice. The, uh, there is a prenatal examination of the fetus during the entire gestation period. The early stages of pregnancy are monitored to some degree during preventive veterinary medicine visits between day 25 to 60. However, little is known of the assessment of the bovine fetus and uterus during the final stages of pregnancy. So, uh, this prenatal examination has not become very popular amongst cattle and buffaloes. During the last trimester of pregnancy, the bovine conceptus can be evaluated indirectly through its annexes, the amniotic and allantoic fluid, and the placental membranes. But only a few reports of ultrasonographic studies of placental abnormalities during late pregnancy in cattle have been published and only hydroelantois 
has been precisely diagnosed. So we still need to have a lot of work done before we can do something on the prenatal examination of cattle and buffaloes. Now, there are a few reports that the allantoic fluid, it can be used a sample to predict the fetal lung maturity. You see, when a pregnancy is at risk, one has to evaluate with the fetus for its lung maturity. If you terminate a pregnancy without the maturity of the fetal lung, maybe the fetus may not survive. In cattle and humans, the lecithin to sphingomyelin ratio is correlated with the fetal production of pulmonary surfactants. But the detection of this continues to be poor in cattle uh, and the technique that has been used is generally uh, causing abortion. So it has little use in uh, the large animal industry. Then consequently, obstetricians have recently developed a rapid screening test to assess the lung maturity based on the amniotic lamellar body count. But again, this test has not become very popular in cattle or buffalo. There is limited information on the fetal movements and fetal body movements in cattle. The depth of the uterus and the size of the calf might be the limiting factors for fetal ultrasonography. There is a lack of well-defined studies to determine the health status of a bovine fetus during the last third of pregnancy. And above all, a very important fact for cattle and mm, buffalo practices that the tests to validate fetal viability or fetal anomaly are of limited value. Why? Because the major motive for bovine practitioners and the farmer as well appears to be the safe completion of gestation. So our motive is for safe completion of gestation. Even if a cow is having a uh, fetus which is having poor development of the brain or if it is having some or other uh, anomaly of its development, we and the farmer would prefer that this pregnancy somehow continues to the complete gestation and parturition. So this is where uh, we are, uh, uh, there is a difference between the medical people and the animal owners uh, and veterinarians as well. The entire is based on the economy. So uh, it's more related to the economy. So we need that the gestation should be completed safely uh, even if the fetus is abnormal, it will be born and uh, the value for the animal owner is the production from the animal. Now we, uh, I would like to uh, talk something on the maternal complications of gestation. I think uh, I don't talk as a teacher. I, I would try to uh, incorporate things uh, which probably might be useful for the practitioners. The hydrops condition, maternal genital tract motility, the disruption of the maternal structures like hernia, prepubic tendon rupture, or problems with the fetus within the uterus. Say, for example, abnormal vaginal discharge or long gestation. The uh, fetal problems of uh, gestation uh, or the fetal complications of gestation, which the clinician might be facing, would be fetal compromise, followed by death of the fetus and abortion. Or maybe fetal mummification and maceration, fetal hydrops conditions. Now, uh, fetal mummification is the fetal death without CL lysis during the last third of get gestation and intact cervical seal. The hematic type of uh, mummification is observed in dairy cattle and buffalo. Because of cotyledon involution, there is accumulation of the blood, which uh, becomes chocolate brown in color. The etiology of fetal mummification is poorly known. However, Campylobacter, bovine virus diarrhea, leptospira, torsion of the umbilical cord, 
are some of the uh, presumptive etiological factors. Now, usually a cow or a buffalo with fetal mummification is referred to a clinician for complaints that the animal either was de has developed an udder which has now receded or the animal became pregnant and then it did not calve. Many a times, mummified fetuses are detected when farmers bring their cattle or buffalo at mid, to mid gestation for pregnancy diagnosis. And uh, sometimes the mummified fetuses, they are accidentally discovered when the animal delivers a mummified or a shriveled fetus. The uh, clinical findings as we talked uh, right now could be an estrus or shrinkage of the udder in primiparous animals. The cervix is closed and the fetus is sterile. Transrectile palpation has been the traditional method and uh, I presume that it uh, still continues to be the method of choice for diagnosis of the fetal mummification in dairy cattle and dairy buffaloes as well. Then uh, some degree of ultrasound, uh, when it is available, you can see a bird of parchment-like structure within the uterus. The uh, mummified fetuses, uh, when they are diagnosed early, they can be delivered with these by the administration of prostaglandins and manual removal after the administration of prostaglandins, estrogens, or etodrine, or maybe isoxoprene. A laparohistrotomy is suggested if the fetus is not delivered by all these means. And colpotomy and hysterotomy is suggested in low value animals. It so happens that sometimes you perform a laparohistrotomy for removal of a mummified fetus and when you open the uterus, you find, and you try to pull the fetus, you find that the fetus is not coming out because many a times with passage of time, the fetus is embedded in the uterine uh, layers of the muscles and uh, it would be required to even incise the deeper layers of the uterus to extract out the mummified fetus. Sometimes, it, is, it has also been observed uh, that a mummified fetus may go out into the perimetrium and sometimes it is enclosed in the and <laughs> when this happens, then it's really very difficult to uh, remove that type of fetuses. The mummified fetuses enclosed within the uterine lumen can be pulled and sometimes you, uh, one can infuse uh, the normal saline and sometimes the lubricants to remove the embedded mummified fetuses within the uterus. And uh, it is also uh, sometimes possible that a mummified fetus is there in the uterus, you are not, it is not coming out with all the routine treatments and you need to go in for a surgical removal. But surgical removal will only, only be possible if the uterus is large enough and hanging in the abdomen so that if you open it from the flank, you can just uh, take out the uterus from that side and then excise it and remove it. If the fetuses or the uterus is within the pelvic cavity, then uh, it's, it's very difficult to remove the fetus even if you approach from the flank. So uh, the crux in this is that the as soon as a mummified fetus is diagnosed, it must be removed. And farmers must be encouraged for the uh, regular checkup of their animals, especially for pregnancy diagnosis. Then uh, we talk of the next condition. the fetal maceration.
the fetal maceration is common in cattle and buffalo and i have put the a big uh, word of caution here you see it sometimes so happens that a animal is showing signs of discomfort a pregnant animal is showing signs of discomfort straining or sometimes giving some discharges even sometimes giving some blood and it is very very usual for the vets to administer a dose of protostrong now what this will do this will prevent the uh, abortion of that fetus but since the os externus has opened so the microbes within the environment or maybe within the soil would enter inside the uterus and this will result into fetal maceration maybe uh, that a fetus when it is macerated maybe it is uh, expelled on its own but it is usual for farmers to find that the animal was previously pregnant and now it is giving uh, the discharge which is having even bones now uh, that is why i i put this word word of caution so failure of abortion of a dead fetus after formation of the fetal bones that is around 4 months followed by disintegration with a partially open cervix uh, and fetal death can occur because of many reasons the outcome of a cow or a buffalo which is having fetal maceration is very very poor because many a times it will take a very pretty long time for all the pieces of the bones to be expelled and a animal will have constant straining here you can see the uh, this uterus has been opened and you can find the bones have been separated and plenty of pus is uh, visible on a ultrasound scan one can find plenty of ecogenic material and hyperechoic bones within the uterus a buffalo uh, that developed fetal maceration due to faulty administration of progesterone uh, when it was showing some signs of discomfort then uh, we now discuss about the next uh, problem which the clinicians face and that is hydroallantois many a times the farmers refer their animals that the animal is around 6 months or 7 months pregnant and suddenly there is enlargement of the abdomen a huge enlargement of the abdomen farmers many a times uh, confuse this with twin pregnancies and they think that probably the animal is having twins so the abdomen has enlarged meticulously but a sudden enlargement of the abdomen uh, must arouse suspicion for the presence of hydroallantois a sudden increase in the allantoic fluid due to fetal membrane pathology leading to bilateral enlargement of abdomen the structural or functional changes in the allantois chorion including its vessels and transudation and collection of fluid resembling plasma the fetuses are very small when a clinician performs a transrectal palpation he is usually not able to palpate the fetus because that is very small and amid the huge amount of fluid that is present it is usually not able to and then the cotyledons might be smaller there may be formation of adventitious cotyledons and uh, it becomes extremely difficult for the clinician to palpate the fetus but the diagnosis is usually based on the history of sudden enlargement of the abdomen and failure to palpate the fetus or the cotyledons either so here you can see uh, uh, the buffaloes also develop hydroallantois and animal which develops hydroallantois might have problems in standing up problems in getting down respiratory distress because of the large amount of fluid 
it creates pressure on the lungs and animal may have difficulty in respiration the pleasant there is placental dysfunction in hydroalent toys and fluid increase in 5 to 20 days animal will show signs of anorexia difficulty in getting up and difficult respiration the uh, cotyledons are small and the fetus is not palpable ultrasound evaluation sometimes uh, can show uh, only the fluid and the cotyledons but this is not very diagnostic you cannot say that this is a case of hydroallantoy so it's <coughs> usually based on the palpation a uh, failure to palpate a fetus and massive enlargement of the abdomen the therapy uh, uh, i think uh, it's very difficult to uh, go in for therapy pregnancy termination can be considered but if the animal is in severe distress if the animal is in severe respiratory distress again uh, it's my opinion that as early as you go in for pregnancy termination more the chances of saving the animals and uh, it was mentioned in many reports that uh, removal of the fluid from the abdomen by abdominocentesis is of little use so uh, because the fluid rapidly reaccumulates and uh, it's uh, usual for the clinician he has to go in for termination of the pregnancy and uh, he can use prostaglandins and corticosteroids and slow intravenous oxytocin a sufficient fluid replacement is an essence but uh, friends the amount of fluid may be up to 200 liters and as soon as the cervix opens and 200 liters of fluid is lost the animal would suddenly go into hypovolemic shock and would succumb so even if you replace very fast ringer's lactate or dextrose normal saline uh, uh, animal usually succumbs and it would depend on the condition of the animal many a times the animal would survive uh, because the fluid is not voluminous and sometimes a very good looking animal suddenly there is a gush of fluid coming out and because hello sir rohit sir Rohit sir participants uh, purohit sir lost his net connection he will be joining back just now please wait
Yes, sir, you can start sharing. Go to slides, yes. Not from the beginning, from the current. Okay, sir. That's clear now? Yes, yes, clear. My voice is continue. audible? Yes, audible, sir. Thank you, sir. So, uh, because of the rapid onset, uh, one can suspect for hydroalent toys, and based on the transrectal findings, one can confirm that it is a case of hydroalent toys. As uh, I said earlier, that pregnancy termination can be considered if the animal is in severe respiratory distress using prostaglandins and corticosteroids plus so in, slow intravenous infusion of oxytocin. But sufficient fluid replacement is an essence. Now, the problem with this is that even if you replace voluminous amount of fluid, because suddenly when the cervix opens and the uh, elentophorion ruptures, the gush of fluid accumulated within the uterus comes out. And so there is hypovolemic shock and many times the animal succumbs. So it's uh, very essential that we care for uh, to our level best to prevent the hypovolemic shock. But uh, many a times, even if you infuse a lot of fluid, uh, because of the sudden release of the fluid, uh, the animal, it succumbs. And uh, in, uh, it was suggested by some people to perform a uh, allantocentesis. But it was found that if you, even if you take out uh, a voluminous amount of fluid, the fluid rapidly reaccumulates. So uh, this uh, case becomes a problem one for the farmer as well as for the treating vet. Caesarean section with slow withdrawal of fluid uh, in uh, some caesarean sections, we tried to perform this activity with cattle. And when we put a smaller size needle, the fluid coming out was very slow and it took at least four hours and you just can't uh, keep the abdomen open of a cow for four or five hours before operating or before opening the uterus so that was not a practical solution when we used a, a bigger size needle then the gush of fluid was very fast and again the animal succumbed so the prognosis in cases of hydroelantois continues to be poor there were some reports uh, which found that the transcervical or transabdominal allantocentesis followed by, uh, uh, once you terminate the pregnancy, uh, you administer a prostaglandin plus corticosteroids, and then 12 hours later, you start the transcervical or transabdominal allantocentesis. A rush catheter, as it is shown over here, can be placed in uh, passing the cervix and placing it into the allantocorion sac. And this, through this rush catheter, the fluid is released slowly over a period of four to eight hours. And then suddenly, uh, when the parturition process starts, much of the fluid is already removed and the animal does not succumb. Of course, you have to uh, observe sufficient fluid replacements. So uh, uh, this uh, photograph showing uh, the uh, allantocentesis in a buffalo. And this one is showing abdominal, uh, transabdominal allantocentesis, wherein the fluid was allowed to escape and simultaneously the animal was allowed, uh, was induced to parturition by administration of prostaglandins. Then the second uh, condition is hydroamnion. Hydroamnion is a dropsical condition of fetal membranes in which there is excessive accumulation of fluid in the amniotic sac, which is associated with the genetic recessive autosomal gene or congenitally defective fetuses. Now, uh, 
normally the fetal salivary glands the lungs and skin they secrete the amniotic uh, they secrete the secretions into the amniotic cavity and this comprises the amniotic fluid the amniotic fluid is very viscous and it is swal swallowed by the fetal bronchi and ultimately absorbed by the intestine and the normal amount of uh, uh, the amniotic fluid would be around 3 to 19 liters uh, uh, 3 to 7.5 liters but uh, when there is hydroamnion there is impaired renal function and uh, the amount of fluid may vary from 20 to 114 liters fetal defects such as cleft palate the uh, pituitary hypoplasia in guernsey cattle or bulldog cows in dexter cattle result in defective cows with hydroamnion clinical signs are not very specific except the slightly enlarged abdomen and discharge of large quantity of amniotic fluid at parturition you can see in this buffalo the uh, abdomen is uh, enlarged not very uh, extensively but it is enlarged the transrectal palpation reveals a enlarged uterus with normal placentomes and ultrasonographic findings are non specific you see in this ultrasound nothing except the fluid is visible so it is very non specific finding maybe the fluid uh, maybe because of other reasons so it's a, not a specific finding medical termination of pregnancy should be considered but care should be taken for fluid replacement even uh, when you terminate a pregnancy a fetus is abnormal it is having a cleft palate or something uh, some problem with the deglutition process and but when you induce the parturition you can see in this picture a gush of fluid is coming out and this much loss of fluid uh, can create hypovolemic shock so this must be taken care of another condition which is uncommon in cattle that is the pre pubic tendon rupture or desmorexis it is less common in cattle because of the presence of a subpubic tendon it is much more common in mares and uh, trauma overweight or uh, jumps or heavy idle mares uh, during late pregnancy might develop the rupture of the prepubic tendon the clinical signs include pain colic severe ventral edema you can see here severe ventral edema and because of the edema sometimes the udder is very displaced and uh, the there is increased respiration reluctance to lie down because when the animal sits there is pain in severe cases there is death the prognosis is poor and canvas straps are suggested to be applied over the abdomen till the completion of the gestation but animals with prepubic tendon ruptures will invariably have difficult births because the abdomen is not properly able to uh, contract for Uh, expulsion of the fetus then abdominal hernias abdominal hernias can occur because of fights horn butting spontaneous rupture of a weak musculature and the animal will show difficulty in walking and dystrophia due to poor abdominal contractions then a support again uh, as for uh, the prepubic tendon rupture a support is suggested uh, till the completion of gestation and then after the parturition one can go in for surgical repair ventral hernias sometimes when the uterus descends in the ventral hernias it becomes extremely difficult and the animal will have great difficulty in the parturition ventral hernias can occur in cattle in buffalo and invariably are a complication that require uh, or that necessitate sometimes uh, uh, they necessitate a surgical uh, repair or surgical removal of the fetus at times when the animal is not able to push the fetus up uh, the abdominal because the uterus has descended in the hernia then they require 
a surgical removal or cesarean section. Then vaginal discharges in pregnant cows. Now, it's very usual to find bloody vaginal discharge in cows, in pregnant cows, as a sign of impending abortion. However, sometimes it may arise due to vaginal injury. And as I said earlier, clinicians often administer progesterone to such cows. This might be dangerous. Before examining the uh, animal by using a, a vaginal scope or maybe vaginal speculum, uh, it would be uh, it may result into formation of uh, fetal uh, a macerated fetus in the uterus, and so it's uh, it, it's a suggestion that any animal which is showing signs of discomfort, maybe this one, it is showing constant straining or maybe showing a mild degree of discharge, it must be examined using a vaginal speculum or a vaginal scope. If the cervix is not open, then of course one can go in for progesterone injections to supplement. But if the cervix, even if it is partially open, I request uh, not to administer a dose of progesterone because that will stop or that will hinder the abortion process. And once that process is hindered, the cervix is already open, the microbes will gain entry into the uterus and it will result into formation uh, of uh, fetal maceration. Then mucopurulent vaginal discharge uh, is often indicative of fetal death and maceration. However, some pregnant cows with pyometra or pregnant cows with vaginitis may show a mucopurulent discharge and even attract bulls. And so therapy must be done carefully. <laughs> it is also uh, very usual for a parturient cow. You can see over here, the uh, sacrosciatic ligaments have relaxed and the cervical seal, it is liquefying. So one must not confuse this with any abnormal discharge because this cow is about to parturiate. And a cow with vaginitis, it may develop some degree of vaginal discharge. Vaginal discharge because of vaginitis or maybe placentitis are very profuse in the mare, but not that profuse in dairy cattle or buffalo. Then severe vulvar edema. Many a times uh, farmers can complain that the animal is pregnant and there is severe vulvar edema. The vulvar edema sometimes may arise because of a tight truss or they may also arise because of a high estrogen level. And when uh, there is no truss applied or this is not because of the pressure, then anti-estrogen tamoxifen citrate, 50 milligram uh, twice a day for three to five days is suggested. Although the pharmacology of uh, anti-estrogen tamoxifen citrate is poorly known, but this is my clinical experience that uh, if we administer tamoxifen citrate, 50 milligram BD for three to five days, the, uh, it is an anti-estrogen, the vulvar edema would decline precipitously. Then uh, a very common problem with pregnant animals is cervical vaginal prolapse. And uh, as you all know, the cervical vaginal prolapse has been classified into first degree or the second degree or the third degree and then the fourth degree. Basically, the prolapse is because of the incompetence of constrictor vestibuli muscles and the vulvar musculature. This uh, has been proven in some of the breeds that prolapse is heritable. And some bloodlines, when I was working with the field, the same breed of animals 
at some locations are having a higher incidence of prolapse the same breed of animals at other locations because they be belong to other bloodlines they are having a lower incidence of prolapse uh, to name rati is a breed in which prolapse is very frequent but some bloodlines in rati also will have a lower incidence of the cervical vaginal prolapse now i need not to stress on how to replace uh, the prolapse uh, most field vets are doing it the only thing is that one has to uh, lift it a bit before replacement so that the animal urinates and the pressure caused by a full bladder is relieved and so uh, less hindrance is offered to the uh, replacement of the prolapse part then uh, there was a very old publication in the journal of american veterinary medical association on uh, the regional anesthetic techniques to reduce the straining because in uh, other countries probably animals with prolapse are sent for slaughter and in countries like ours at many locations uh, because the slaughter is banned these techniques i thought could be useful at some locations the caudal epidural anesthesia comprising of 0.5 to 1 ml per 220 kg will provide regional anesthesia for 2 to 3 hours a constant straining is a problem for the farmer and he invariably complains to the vet that animal is showing constant straining and uh, clinicians often use maybe uh, often use maybe the xylagen or maybe uh, the sequel to calm down the constant uh, tenesmus but it's also pertinent that when replacement is done properly after sufficient washing and sufficient uh, that the straining would be less and then if you apply uh, local anesthetic gel before replacement the straining would be less uh, so these are some of the techniques which i have shown here caudal epidural anesthesia or sacral paravertebral anesthesia they can help in reducing the straining then a pudendal nerve block can also help reduce the straining in dairy cattle then uh, it was also suggested that continuous caudal epidural anesthesia using alcohol can be used for uh, reducing the straining but desensitization caused uh, from alcohol uh, by the deep myelination nervous tissue with subsequent loss of sensation uh, may sometimes result into limb paralysis and uh, at times permanent tail paralysis and the regeneration of the nervous tissue may take 2 to 3 months so these types of techniques should be carefully done and with the close consent of the owner that maybe these type of uh, problems may arise so uh, the owner must be beforehand warned about it then uh, retention sutures the three type of commonly used sutures used for retaining vaginal prolapse the purse string uh, using a buner tape or maybe a ribbon a sterile ribbon or the bootless sutures uh, now uh, these pictures they are showing the sutures applied to buffaloes for retaining the prolapse now cervicopexy or the winkler operation is used uh, has been suggested uh, for fixation of the cervix to the pre pubic tendon and uh, specialized needles they are required to just fix the cervix to the pre pubic tendon uh personally i haven't uh, used this technique so i might not be the appropriate person to comment on the practical uh, uh, value of this approach then vaginopexy or the modified minchev method for fixing of the vagina has been suggested and there are a few reports and then there was a 
video, uh, YouTube video from Dr. Pumar, uh, uh, who uh, was carrying out this technique very efficiently. And I think uh, in cases where uh, the value of the animal uh, is much less, one can go in for these type of techniques. Or maybe if the person performing the technique is efficient, he can go in with uh, very good animals also. Then, uh, as I said earlier, that the Kerala vets, they are performing exceptionally well. And in fact, I had been on the learning end from them uh, for many a techniques that they are performing practically. So these are the three photographs which uh, I received from that group in which a buffalo where uh, the complete removal hysterectomy was suggested. The VAT, he performed this uh, type of uh, fixation, uh, transvaginal fixation of the uh, vagina by uh, using a type of, uh, this is type of a Minchev method. And then the vulvar lips were also additionally sutured to prevent the prolapse. So uh, I really congratulate uh, the uh, Kerala vets for doing very exceptionally good work in the field. Now, when I was seeing this picture, it came to my mind, the cervical paxi through flank laparotomy. Uh, you perform a laparotomy from the flank and suture the cervix uh, by uh, visualizing uh, through maybe uh, through that incision and you suture the part of the cervix with the prepubic tendon. It came to my mind that uh, the fixation of the cervix to the prepubic tendon can be performed by flank endoscopy. You see, endoscopy is becoming popular in cattle using the uh, rigid scopes, this one or this one, and the flexible scopes. Uh, if one can insert a scope from the flank, visualize the cervix, and tag the cervix with a prepubic tendon, I think that would be a very good approach for fixation. And uh, my friends, uh, I am showing this picture. This is a very uh, small endoscope that you can attach with your Android phone. It is available at Amazon. And if you develop a technique to use this scope, I think you can develop it very greatly. And hats off to the Indian vets who are uh, performing exceptionally well. Then uh, prolapse, uh, the recurrence or the contractions will cause the recurrent prolapse and the truss is a very viable option for the farmer. A truss made of canvas straps, of cotton canvas straps, could be very good because it causes least injury and it retains the uh, prolapse inside. And for pregnant buffaloes, this could be a very viable option. But again, if the prolapse, once it occurs, it is replaced uh, with sufficient hygiene and sufficient antibiotics or whatever is required, the clinician is the best judge, then it would be more efficient. There have been reports of using the truss made of the nylon uh, the ropes, but I presume because nylon can be injurious and because it can cause pressure necrosis. So when uh, it is a better option to use a canvas strap made of cloth. Then this is one interesting uh, uh, report which I came across and that is the prolapse of a gravid uterus and the a part of the gravid uterus it came out because it's unusual it's a unusual and this is the non-gravid horn and the clinicians they replaced it successfully and uh, um, one can think of that such type of cases may also come across then the pressure on the truss 
may cause vulvar edema. You can see here a plenty of vulvar edema uh, appears because of extraordinary pressure applied on the truss. So if it is too loose, the uh, prolapse will come out. If it is too tight, it can cause uh, pressure necrosis and vulvar edema. Then there are some homeopathic remedies uh, with, uh, I cannot guarantee, but uh, with mm, variable uh, results which can be used. And this includes CPR 200 or Creosotum 200 or Ignatia or Opium 200. All these medicines can be given to animals uh, in the liquid form. And because the homeopathic concept, it works on the concept that as soon as the uh, drug, it comes in contact with any uh, mucosal tissue, its action starts. It is very difficult to administer homeopathic drugs orally because they are contraindicated to be used with feed. They can be used with water, but then the animal does not drink it. They can be administered on the tongue, but then it's cumbersome to open the mouth of the animal and again and again take out the tongue. So it's a viable option to drop these drops on the uh, nose or muzzle of the animal and animal will immediately just lick it. Then another problem uh, which clinicians can face is prolonged gestation. Farmers often complain the animal has uh, completed uh, a long, long period, more than nine and a half months. Sometimes they complain that it, they, it has completed more than 10 months, but uh, it's a difficult situation for the clinician to find out how many exact months have been completed. It often results in an error at the farmer level that the, he presumed that the animal was pregnant, animal came into estrus again, and it was mated and became pregnant again. So he confuses with a pregnancy of two months earlier when he uh, got the animal inseminated, but the animal became pregnant two months later. This is one situation. But in fact, fetal mummification or border disease, hydrocephalus, feeding of toxic feeds, and progesterone injections can all uh, prolong the gestation. For animals, it has been suggested that progesterone injections, if uh, they are given on the uh, problem of recurrent abortions, they should be stopped after the eight month. Because beyond that period, if you administer progesterone injections, that may prolong the gestation. The Color Doppler evaluations of umbilical cord and cotyledon vasculature or vasculature of middle uterine artery. We tried to find out uh, in uh, a few studies that if we can predict the vasculature of the middle uterine artery, but the results were not very conclusive and as were the ultrasonographic findings. The uh, vasculature of the cotyledons and the dimensions of the cartilidins can give you some idea, some idea, but they are not very conclusive. And then the uh, vasculature of the middle uterine artery uh, using color doctoral evaluations can predict, uh, to some extent they can predict, but they are not very conclusive as of today. In times to come, maybe we have more precise evaluations and more uh, better evaluations to come to some conclusions, but it's a difficult period. Uh, it's a difficult task for the clinician when he's asked that the animal is having a prolonged gestation and if he accidentally injects a prostaglandin or maybe a corticosteroid, a uh, premature fetus may be born. So the clinician is not very sure and he does not have a way out to precisely, very precisely predict, uh, especially if it is beyond nine months or maybe he may sometimes uh, find after the birth of the fetus that the based on the teeth of the fetus, he can find that yes, of course, the fetus uh, uh, had a prolonged 
gestation. Then inducing parturition in cattle and buffalo is a seldom uh, it's a seldom required approach. It's uh, maybe at farms the there may be a requirement of induced parturition, but at the farmer's doorstep only under conditions of severe stress the farmer may request inducing the parturition. But at times uh, the farmers they may uh, think that the cervix is not open or the animal is uh, has completed the gestation he has the record parturition can be very easily uh, induced in dairy cattle and dairy buffalo as well i'm limiting my talk to cattle and buffalo because uh, it was uh, required by the organizers that most vets are the large animal practitioners so i'm limiting my talk to cattle and buffalo only then the use of corticosteroids it has been mentioned that prostaglandin injections are poorly effective between the 5 to 8 month period when given alone so they must be combined with corticosteroids in the field many a times field vets have been using valithamate bromide alone or in combination with prostaglandins for inducing parturition and then there was a report which suggested the administration of denaverine hydrochloride plus carbetosin for the safe uh, delivery of the fetus. But the problem is that the uh, it was also suggested that the fetus must be uh, within the birth canal before you use denaverine and carbetosin. The administration of oxytocin uh, must be closely monitored because if you administer oxytocin without the uh, dilation of the uh, cervix then it can be sometimes dangerous it can cause uterine rupture or maybe the extra uterine uh, location of the fetus sometimes because of that rupture now we come to the obstetrical disorders during parturition the most most common obstetrical disorder during parturition is dystocia or difficult birth and then rupture of the birth canal because sometimes the rupture of the birth canal can occur during parturition because of sharp instruments or most uh, many a times And so uh, it, it, it is something which, uh, uh, which is challenging for the new veterinarians. Now, uh, it's pertinent to uh, understand that although uh, dystopia might occur, when to intervene. I remember an episode when I was serving with the dairy department. Our managing director, he called me because his cow was about to cow. And the first water bag had already ruptured. He asked me, you just put your hand inside and take out the calf. I said, no, you wait for two hours. How much time has appeared? He said, just uh, five minutes back, the first water bag has ruptured. I said, no, you please wait. Because it, it is pertinent to understand that the uh, farmers also make this mistake. Once the first water bag has ruptured and the fetus along uh, and wrapped in the second water bag, uh, the fetal legs have come out uh, and wrapped in the second water bag, they usually tear it out and pull the fetuses. And in this uh, pulling, they sometimes convert a safe parturition into a difficult birth because, and it's, uh, I have seen that farmers often apply uh, the soil because when they are pulling the legs of the fetus, they are enwrapped in the uh, amniotic fluid, which is very slippery. So the easily available uh, thing to nearby is soil. They just put their hands in soil and then just pull the fetus. This is one approach which should be discouraged. Farmers must be uh, taught or rather 
they must be uh, made aware about the dangers of using soil in pulling a fetus. So here are some of the hints. When to intervene? The water sac is visible for two hours and the cow is not doing anything. It's not straining. It is not trying. The cow has been trying minutes with no progress. So one must immediately intervene. The cow has been trying and then quits for more than 15 minutes. It should resume within 5 to 10 minutes. And then outgoing, outcoming calf is showing signs of distress or the placenta is coming out before the calf. Or to the uh, clinician, it appears that delivery is abnormal because of the faulty disposition of the fetus. So under all these conditions, one must intervene. But if the first water bag has come out and it's only five minutes and the second what the legs of the fetus have come at the uh, vulva out of the vulva lips appeared one should not intervene and wait for some time the causes of dystochia uh, we analyzed a lot of cases at our center and we found that fetal pelvic disproportion either the fetus is bigger or the maternal pelvis is shorter was the most common cause of difficult births in cattle and fetal malpresentations were equally common in buffalo as well as dairy cattle and the most most common cause of difficult births in the buffalo was uterine torsion so friends now we talk about some uh, uh, clinical cases maybe non-progressive second stage labor what we call the uterine inertia uh, the uh, a subtle problem for the clinicians is that animals they are referred to the clinicians often very late and it is the nearby person who handles the difficult birth or maybe it was a easier birth he converted it into a difficult birth and then referred to the clinician sometimes you 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 see in this picture one of the leg of the calf is out the head of the calf is out the second leg is not out you see uh, one of uh, a girl student she came to me for admission in masters in veterinary gynecology she asked sir should i take gynecology i said what's the problem do you think that gynecology or obstetrics is a matter of uh, strength no had it been a matter of strength the farmers have more strength than us it's a matter of skill and you need to learn those skills you will find plenty of people to apply a lot of strength when you just a fetus will not be delivered or uterine inertia what we were non-progressive second stage of labor maybe because of calcium deficiency which is very common nervousness lack of exercise or the more common one in cattle is exhaustion one of the leg is inside and the animal the uh, other leg and the head of the fetus is outside the animal has exhausted trying to deliver this fetus and because of that there is uh, exhaustion of the uterine musculature and uterine inertia so until unless you correct one of the leg again, this will not be uh, sold out. Uh, calcium therapy may help if uh, this is not the situation. If uh, the situation is uh, something different, it is primary uterine inertia. Oxytocin administration must be done very carefully. As I said, it can lead to uterine rupture. And in cows with secondary uterine inertia, the primary problem must be solved first you see one of the leg is inside and you are trying to pull it out it will not come out it's not a matter of strength it is a matter of skill again i remember one case when i was in the field uh, one uh, late night a person came to me doctor just get up my buffalo is in problem i said what happened he said no she has uh, the fetus was not coming out but that we have taken care of now, uh, the entire uh, abdominal contents, they have come out. I went to his place and uh, I was astonished to find 
most of the abdominal organs out. I asked him, what, what, what happened? How they came out? He said, sir, we, the fetus was not coming out, so we pulled it with a tractor. Astonishing. I said, you poor fellow, you don't know. Uh, and now this buffalo is in peril. And I will try to save it out, but it is in severe danger. And I don't say that uh, surely I would be able to save it. So obstetrics is a matter of skill. It's not a matter of strength. Then uterine ruptures, spontaneous uterine ruptures can occur at a weak point, but accidental ruptures can occur during faulty rolling of the animal with uterine torsion. A buffalo brought to you with severe uterine ruptures may result into severe internal hemorrhages and death. And a clinician would hardly be able to know what was the point of bleeding in that animal. Animals with small uterine ruptures may show transient colic without fetal delivery. Sometimes abdominal organs may prolapse. And uh, sometimes if there is a rupture, you can see over here in this buffalo, he brought the intestines in a gunny bag. And when we tried to uh, operate the animal, put the intestines back, the animal was in severe, severe shock, toxemia, and before we could operate it, the animal died. It uh, is sometimes uh, usual for the clinician after delivery of a fetus to administer a dose of oxytocin, and this will take care of the minor ruptures. But if the ruptures are sufficiently large enough and a lot of blood loss is there, then an emergency laparotomy has to be done to save the life of the animal. Then we come to another uh, condition commonly found by the clinicians, the uterine torsion. Torsion, as you all know, is the twisting of a pregnant uterine horn on its own axis. Uterine torsion can occur during mid to late gestation, yet it is common during the parturition period in cattle and buffalo. Now, uh, a lot of approaches and a lot of predisposing factors and uh, were suggested that uterus has no support except the broad ligaments during the gestation. And the Allantois is fused with the amnion and the amnion is tightly wrapped around the fetus. So when the fetus rotates, the uterus also rotates. And the posture of the animal while getting up and lying down was uh, presumed to be one of the reasons for the uterine torsion. But to me, it appears that inordinate fetal movements. Suddenly the fetus moves. Fetus, is, fetus uh, may have movements during gestation. So suddenly when the fetus moves, then the and it rotates around, the uterus will also rotate. Once it is rotated, it will not be possible for the fetus to get into the normal position. And this results into uterine torsion. A plenty of uh, work done at the Punjab Agricultural University it showed that buffaloes have weaker, having weaker broad ligaments might have, might be predisposed to uh, uterine torsion. And buffaloes, why buffaloes have a lot higher incidence of uterine torsion? Because the abdomen is deep and capacious, the amniotic fluid is reduced during the terminal stages of gestation, and uh, the uh, inordinate fetal movements are more in the buffalo as compared to cattle. The uh, reports also mention that the wallowing habits of the buffalo entering into water, close confinement, and hilly tracts can predispose to uterine torsion. But studies carried out at Punjab Agriculture University, Ludhiana, they showed that buffaloes that were allowed to wallow hardly developed any uh, uterine torsion, whereas the buffaloes which were continuously maintained at the farm, a few of them developed the uterine torsion. So uh, 
I presume it's not because of the valuing, but maybe because of the inordinate fetal movements and the weaker broad ligaments. The clinical signs of uterine torsion uh, include colicky pains, sometimes anorexia, twisting of the vulva lips as is shown in this picture, and non-progressive second stage of labor. The uh, very, very common problem, which is being confused by the, some of the clinicians and the farmers as well, is that they think that the cervix has not dilated. Because on putting your hand inside the uh, vagina, you find that the cervix is not continuous with the vagina. So it has not dilated. Whereas in fact, the, uh, this has occurred because of the uterine torsion. So whenever uh, there are complaints of uh, the uh, cervical dilation problems, one must also think of the uh, uterine torsion uh, for probable existence of uterine torsion. The direction of the torsion could be right or left, clockwise and anticlockwise, and the location could be pre-cervical and post-cervical, and the degree of torsion might vary from 90 degree to even up to 760 degree prolapses, uh, uterine torsions have been on record. The uh, <laughs> twisting of the vaginal mucous membranes have been mentioned as the peculiar feature in many books, but practically the uh, transrectal palpation is the diagnostic dilemma, the, uh, is the diagnostic method. The broad ligament on the side of the torsion under the uterus and the ligament on the other side is crossed to opposite side and tense. You see, these are the broad ligaments. When uterus rotates to this side, this ligament will go underneath and the opposite side ligament will cross over. So when one puts his hand in the rectum, he can feel that there is some ligament going underneath the uterus. And that is the side of the torsion. It is very pertinent to diagnose the right side of the torsion because that will decide your approach for uh, correcting the torsion. The uh, as uh, I forgot to mention one thing, the general condition of the patient in any case, it applies to obstetrical cases also, it applies to medicine, it applies to surgery also, that the general condition of the patient is of utmost significance. A owner has brought a cow to you with complaint of uh, difficult birth and you being very enthusiastic, start immediately uh, correcting the position of the fetus and then you pull out the fetus with all your strength to find that the fetus is removed and the animal has died. So it's very pertinent to take care for the general condition of the patient. If the animal is toxemic, if the animal is uh, having uh, other problems or maybe it is having uh, low fluids, then one should first take care of those things and then go in for the therapy. The approaches for correction of the uterine torsion include the sudden rolling of the cow, rotation of fetus per vaginum. It's mentioned in books, but it's not practically possible. I have, practically, I haven't seen any case in which I could just rotate the fetus per vaginum. Maybe uh, others... Or for others, it is possible. Then rolling of the cow, sudden rolling of the cow, and slow rolling of the cow with the Schaeffer's method using a wooden plank is the appropriate approach for correcting the uterine torsion. The thing is that uh, uh, sometimes one thinks that animal is having a right-sided uterine torsion. You are... Uh, casting the animal on the right side, and then again you are rolling it on the right side, won't it be doubled? It's not like that. One has to imagine a three-dimensional picture. The uterus being heavy organ, when you roll the animal, the uterus will remain there and rest of the body would be rotated. So the torsion would be corrected. So here is how you perform a uh, 
uh, rolling of the buffalo. Uh, the animal is laid down in recumbency on the side of the torsion. A wooden plank is applied and a person, he gets over this plank and the animal is slowly moved. The person who is standing over here, when the animal is rotating, the uterus tries to come up. Because of the pressure of that person over here, the uterus is pushed uh, to the opposite side and this way it is being corrected. Let me show you one video on how we can uh, So here's the buffalo is uh, costered and then we apply a plank over here and people, a person would stand over here and a slowly the buffalo will be rolled and he will continue going upwards and as the buffalo is rolled, he gets down. And this way the uterine torsion can be corrected. Uh, similarly, it can be corrected in cattle and uh, we usually you apply some oil over the abdominal area so that when you are putting a plank to 12 to, uh, to 14 feet, a uh, very heavy wooden plank over the abdomen, it does not cause bruises over the abdominal area. Then once the, uh, uh, the torsion is corrected because when the, uh, there was torsion, the vessels of the uterus of the fetus would be compressed. And as soon as the prolapse is corrected, you can find sometimes a gush of blood coming out. And this is an indication that probably the prolapse, uh, the torsion has been corrected. After detorting uh, once, the clinician again checks per rectum if the bands which were going underneath, they have uh, become straight, then probably they will not be palpable. And then one can think that yes, now the torsion has been corrected. The, the, if in one roll, you, uh, a clinician finds that uh, the torsion uh, was approximately 180 degree and it has now come to 90 degree, one can again cast the animal, again give a roll and again examine it. After every roll, one must examine whether the torsion has been detorted or not. It is suggested that uh, at the max, one can give three rolls. And if even after three rolls, the torsion has not been corrected, one can think of going in for a laparoistotomy. Uh, it is usual that when uh, the torsion cases are submitted to clinicians at an early date or uh, sorry, early time, then uh, it can be corrected easily. But when uh, sufficient time gap has occurred, then these uh, torsion uh, are difficult to be corrected by rolling. And one has to go in for a operative procedure for correcting the, uh, it's uh, during a operative procedure, uh, it is mentioned in the books that you detort the uterus, but it's my practical experience that when you try to detort the uterus, it's not possible. You have to just incise the uterus, take out the fetus, suture it back and just leave it. It will detort spontaneously after the removal of the fetus. And uh, so uh, after a uh, operative procedure, one can uh, inject some uh, uterine motility stimulants like oxytocin or if the bleeding is more, uh, oxytocin and ergometrine, they can be uh, injected. The post-torsion correction, if the cervix is not dilated, administration of prostaglandins and local application of carboxymethyl cellulose has been suggested. We, we usually uh, uh, administer a dose of prostaglandin and then uh, ask the owner to wait for 
uh, some 12 hours and uh, most of the times if the cervix is not open it opens within 12 to 24 hour variable and uh, the fetus can be delivered but if after torsion correction if the cervix is open one can uh, one should uh, think of removing the fetus uh, so that uh, the further problem to the animal is stopped then uh, a common as i said earlier cervical dilation failure is a common problem in cattle it's seldom a problem in the water buffalo uh, cervical dilation uh, involves a complex process and it is multifactorial uh, it involves many enzymatic breakdowns and when fully dilated the cervix is continuous you see uh, one can palpate the cervix by putting his hand inside when it is not dilated but when it is fully dilated one cannot find where is the cervix the uh, cervical dilation problems are less common in buffalo due to more capacious pelvis larger area of the ilium and free and easily separable fifth sacral vertebra when cervix is not dilated sufficiently it is palpable by transrectal examination this we have already talked uh, the animal should be examined to rule out uterine torsion sometimes it is beneficial to wait for some time and then evaluate again the uh, beta 2 adrenergics such as salbutamol terbutalin and the commercially available isoxaprine hydrochloride 50 to 100 mg intramuscular or intravenous for cattle and buffaloes uh, can be tried along with manual manipulation but results are inconsistent not consistent or they are inconsistent clenbutrol uh, unfortunately it is not uh, right now not available in our country can be given at the dose rate of 0.3 mg iv or intramuscular then uh, valithamide bromide or epidocin is a potent uh, analgesic and it has been suggested at the dose rates of 80 mg in cattle and uh, to some extent uh, but it actually helps in cases where cervical dilation failure is because of cervical spasm and uh, not in cases where it is not because of the spasm local application of misoprostol which is used routinely in humans and uh, the mares uh, did not uh, uh, result into consistent uh, dilation of the cervix as was intramuscular administration of ritotin in cattle in the presence of an emphysematous fetus it is again a question which many a vets and many a animal owners might be interested that uh, there is the presence of an emphysematous fetus and there is uh, what uh, has been uh, called as the bandel's ring dystocia there is a small ring in the cervix if you just cut it the fetus will come out i personally am of the opinion that cutting the cervix without control is not a good option if you can take the cervix out of the birth uh, out of the vulvar lips and you can apply a cut then you can suture it but if you cut it inside and then you cannot suture it when you pull the fetus the tear would be very big and it will be very difficult for the clinician then to repair the cervix so uh, if you perform a cervicotomy you must perform it if you can suture it otherwise it's not a very good option then other causes of insufficient dilation could be congenital strictures in the vagina or fibrous tissue bands abscess in the vagina or maybe vaginal tumors sometimes may cause difficulty but most of the times uh, the vaginal tumors or fibrous uh, they may uh, seldom cause difficulty in parturition but later subsequent to parturition they are prolapsed out and uh, then uh, they are in uh, they are uh, a curiosity for the treating vet uh, he can go in for surgical removal of those 
then vaginal cystocele or collapse of bladder through urethra or vaginal rupture can occur in cattle in buffalo and the bladder must be replaced first after pushing the legs of the fetus back in the birth canal vulvar stenosis uh, fetus can be delivered by traction with or without episiotomy cut but episiotomy cut is not very difficult because you can place a cut uh, at the skin mucosa junction and that you can easily suture it so it's not very difficult this is a vaginal cystocele in a buffalo then uh, i need not to uh, teach you as a teacher I, we need to discuss the clinical aspects how what should be done in fetal monstrosities and their delivery you see the most uh, monster is a fetus with visible congenital defects usually changing its appearance the most uh, uh, commonly reported monstrosity is pyrosoma cellulis which has congenital curvature of the legs and congenital curvature of the ankylosis of the legs and congenital curvature of the spine because the fetus cannot straighten up partial fetotomy can be performed in these type of fetuses or maybe if it is very big then one can think of going in for a cesarean section similarly cystosoma reflexus is a uh, monster that is very uh, commonly reported in cattle in buffalo and uh, the intestines of the fetus are exposed so clinicians often confuse whether the intestines are of the fetus or they are of the dam the intestines of the fetus would be very small that of the dam would be much bigger and then these intestines are coming out from the abdomen of the fetus so uh, one can uh, be very sure that this is a cystosoma reflexus these types of fetuses can be delivered uh, sometimes with ease and at other times with difficulty then a lot of conjoined monstrosity duplication of one or parts of the fetus what uh, <clears throat> are known as the coelosomian monstrosities or conjoined twins these types of monstrosities have been very widely reported in buffalo and many of them have been delivered by fetotomy others have required cesarean section duplication of one part or maybe other parts or multiple parts would create a problem of passage of this fetus from the birth canal and one has to go in for uh, sometimes for uh, there are reports of fetuses with two heads being delivered normally and there are reports of fetuses with four four legs also being delivered normally but it is nature sometimes that can happen but usually these types of fetuses would require assistance then fetal dropsical conditions this fetus fetal ascites a fetus with accumulation of the fluid in the abdomen would cause problem in its passage from the birth canal and a simple option would be apply a cut on the abdomen and then all the fluid from this fetus would be drained out and then the fetus can be uh, delivered with ease anasarcus fetuses which have generalized subcutaneous edema multiple cuts can be given on such type of fetuses and this leads to release of fluids and then they can be delivered a another uh, fetal dropsical condition is hydrocephalus a fetus which with accumulation of fluid in the meninges of the brain and so the head of the fetus is enlarged uh, while passage of the fetus from the birth canal the head of the fetus exerts the maximum maximum pressure and when it is enlarged then it creates difficulty a small cut on the fetus would uh, help in delivery of the fetus sometimes a fetus is born with a hydrocephalus without any difficulty and these type of calves uh, it has been reported they can be surgically corrected at a later time then correction of the fetal malpostures uh, the uh, importance lies in the dilation of the birth canal manipulation traction lubrication and appropriate force 
you see the normal delivery posture of the fetus is both four legs extended the head resting on the knees this is how and then the fetus comes in the form of a arc from the birth canal if common problem is either the flexion of the limb or deviation of the head these are two most common problems with uh, the posture of the fetus and a clinician can very well judge it out the limb flexion uh, can be corrected by the obstetrician's hand he can just catch hold of the flex limb and important is that the hoof of the calf must be cupped in your hand so that it does not cause injury to the birth canal and uh, one can then when both the legs are extended the head is straight then one can apply traction on both the limbs and the fetus will come out then in breech births where the hind legs uh, or, or, are flexed and sometimes uh, a clinician only feels the tail that is a true breech posterior presentation uh, what we also call as the caudal presentation right now one can extend the limbs and then uh, once both the hind limbs are straight this type of fetus can be delivered with ease simply and simply by applying traction then <laughs> a very very good option for a obstetrician the first one uh, for the obstetrician is his own hand which he carries always with him and the second option would be a long obstetric hook in difficult births where fetuses or uh, where clinician is called after sufficient time uh, then it usually so occurs that because of the uterine contractions the fluids are lost and the birth canal contracts this creates difficulty in passage of the obstetrician's hand sometimes and this also causes difficulty in correcting the head of the fetus and at that time the most most useful uh, instrument for a obstetrician would be a long stainless steel obstetric hook which is not very sharp at the end but uh, and then while placing the rope these are the approaches which should be used if you place the rope here if the fetus is live if you place it on the neck directly and the fetus is live you pull it then it will cause strangulation and fetus may die so it's usually suggested in this approach these types of long obstetric hook can be applied to the inner canthus of the eye of the fetus for uh, straightening the lateral dilated neck or head of the fetus but it's important it is pertinent to understand that hooks must be applied only in dead fetuses if you apply hooks in the eye then eye ball will tear up sometimes uh, if a dead fetus is present a clinician or a obstetrician he applies the hook and the eye ball of fetus is already dead but the area of the eye ball the bone surrounding it also tear up and then it will uh, he applies it on the other eye that also tears up then it will be a viable option to introduce this hook inside inside the mouth of the fetus and then tilt it upside and then pull it out because then the uh, nothing will break out it will uh, hook up in these bones and then uh, the fetus head of the fetus can be straightened then it's uh, usual uh, for uh, sometimes it's uh, one has to pull the fetus and uh, the fetus must be pulled in a arc fashion because the fetus when it is coming from the uterus again it will coming like this so if you pull it downwards first and then you can pull it 
straight. Then there are certain hooks. Uh, presumably, these sharp uh, or hooks would be difficult to be applied in a live fetus and should not be applied. But when you are performing a fetotomy, you can use these hooks for pulling parts of the fetus. And this is a Cray Scottler hook, which can be applied to torn out tissue. And you can apply it here. You apply rope over here, and then you pull it out. Then uh, we come to the uh, fetotomy or the uh, cutting of the parts of the fetus for its easy vaginal delivery. You see, for fetotomy to be, uh, uh, there has been plenty of debates about uh, performing either fetotomy or cesarean sections. Now, it varies from case to case. If the clinician, he, uh, he, he is the best judge. He, he evaluates that there is space. I can cut a part of the fetus and then I will be able to pull out uh, the rest of the fetus. Then it's all right. But it's, uh, it's usually a waste of time. If you cut some parts of the fetus, you are not able to take out the fetus later on because there is no space in the birth canal. And when you are exha exhausted, you then go in for a cesarean section. So it's uh, really pertinent. Uh, it depends on the uh, experience of the clinician. He, he can uh, judge whether I will be able to cut one or two parts of the fetus, although in the literature, six cuts have been described. But uh, I think in clinical cases that are presented to us, uh, I think six cuts are uh, rarely possible. So one or two cuts cutting, uh, you see the fetus is in the birth canal, the head and neck are deviated and you cannot put your hand inside. There is little of space. Case has been presented to you after three hours of passage of the onset of labor and you are not able to pass your hand inside. Then one can decide to cut one of the leg so that your hand can go inside, correct the deviated head or the neck and then correct uh, or pull the fetus accordingly. So it, it usually depends. Uh, uh, there, there should be no debate. Fetotomy is uh, suggested for fetotomy cases and cesarean is suggested for cesarean cases. They, they cannot be replaced. Yes, if, if one is not efficient or if one cannot perform fetotomy, you can go in for cesarean section. We have been uh, coming across cases where we opened the uterus and we were not able to uh, remove the fetus. So we had to perform the fetotomy even after a, uh, during a cesarean section because the fetus was grossly uh, abnormal and if we put a cut, a extensive cut on the uterus, you see, we had been uh, doing uh, the cesarean sections with uh, trying to uh, take out the fetus with a minimum possible cut. Uh, so fetotomy is restricted to a dead fetus. <laughs> One should not perform fetotomy in a live fetus. And there should be a sufficient space in the birth canal. And if the fetus is in five centimeters, the survival rates, they decline after a cesarean section. So under those cases, one can think of first uh, attempting to fetotomy. But it is pertinent that sufficient space in the birth canal should be available. If by cutting one leg or maybe the head, if you can move your head in, uh, hand, uh, a clinician can move his hand inside and correct the rest of the fetus, then it's a viable option. Otherwise, it's not. So fetotomies can be performed uh, by subcutaneous or percutaneous approach. Uh, uh, for field vets, they can perform a subcutaneous fetotomy. Sometimes if, even if you don't have uh, a Gunther or a Linde's uh, knife, one can use simply a scalpel blade. And then you cut the skin. The head is deviated in this. You need to cut one of the limbs so that you can put your hand inside and uh, correct the head of the fetus. So uh, 
subcutaneous fetotomy, you have to cut the skin and then remove the muscles, etc., and then you have to pull it. So the skin uh, remains intact. Uh, uh, the skin remains intact, and the underneath structure is dislodged from the joint. So these are uh, some of the fetotomy, uh, subcutaneous fetotomy procedures being performed in dairy cattle. The scarf, it has both legs have to be removed and uh, then it was possible to deliver the fetus. Then percutaneous fetotomy is performed using a fetotom and the wire saw, it has to be placed on the neck or maybe on the limb, on the shoulder or maybe on the thorax or cutting pelvic bisection if uh, it's not possible. The, there is a hip lock and you just cannot uh, take out the fetus, then you can cut it. Now, after performing the fetotomy, it's pertinent for the clinician to examine and make sure that every part of the fetus is removed. The uterus should be examined for tears, cuts, or presence of another calf. And if the animal is toxemic, appropriate therapy should be given. It's not like that, that once the fetus is removed and fetotomy has been performed, now your job is over. So one should be very careful. Then we come to cesarean section. It is one of the oldest surgical procedures and the indications could be immature heifers, pelvic fractures, cervical dilation failures, fetal monsters, uterine tears, incorrectable uh, dystocia or incorrectable uterine torsion. The restraint and, and uh, operative sites will vary. Standing flank laparotomy can be performed, a ventral recumbent, midline laparotomy can be performed, and in dorsal recumbency, low flank, paramedian, and oblique ventrolateral approaches can be performed. The anesthesia uh, might include the paravertebral nerve block, uh, which desensitizes this much area of the cow, or maybe inverted L block using the local infiltration anesthesia. In most dairy cattle and buffalo cesarean sections, a inverted L block is sufficient. Sometimes uh, maybe if the buffalo is uh, very uh, nervous, you may require uh, administration of low dosage of uh, other things, but it should be uh, the xylogen should be very carefully used in the buffalo. Even one ml is the upper uh, limit of xylogen being used in buffalo. Then one can perform a flank laparotomy, a uh, standing left paralumbar ciliotomy, or uh, these are the locations for the midline, the paramedian, and the oblique ventrolateral. And uh, now the purpose of showing this uh, picture is, this is a uh, operation theater of the Pennsylvania University. You see for one cow, they have a lot of facility and a lot and lot of people who are assigned these people, they will handle the calf. This one will handle this thing. And these are three surgeons and you can see air conditioned rooms, everything. And my purpose of showing this is that uh, these types of facilities might not be available to us. And I'm uh, hats off to the vets. I, uh, this uh, vet, he performed the cesarean section at the farmer's store. And uh, maybe uh, the, it is uh, not necessary. It is necessary to uh, care for the sepsis of the operative site. It's not necessary that you have a very hefty uh, operation theaters and everything. So uh, uh, hats off to these vets who are performing these uh, cesarean sections in the field. Uh, in my classes, I had been requesting all the students to perform the cesarean sections in the field. Sometimes I receive an answer, a query or answer that, sir, we don't have 
uh, approaches for sterilization of our instruments. I give them an example that medical people, when they start their practice in rural areas, they use a pressure cooker for sterilization of their instruments. Why can't you use that? So it's a matter of uh, the urge to work that will make you uh, capable of treating the animals or performing the surgeries. It's not uh, the very uh, hi-fi uh, theaters or very, uh, it's the skill you have to learn. So again, uh, this is how uh, I need not to, show, I, I, I have to show you because um, we have been using the oblique ventrolateral about the carcass pruralis, but any surgeon, he, he can use the uh, approach for, of his choice. Every site has got its own limitations and advantages as well as disadvantages. So the skin is inside, the subcutaneous fat is uh, uh, separated and when the peritoneum is visible, a nick is made and then you put your finger inside and guide uh, the incision through your finger so that you don't cut anything else uh, underneath the peritoneum and then the uterus is located on the, uh, brought to the operative site and uh, it is packed with sterile drapes and one can then uh, incise the uterus, take out the fetus and uh, then suture the uterus back. The, uh, it's uh, really very important for the clinician to uh, take all care for the sepsis and uh, for uh, maintaining the aseptic conditions and try his level best to minimize uh, the contamination of the abdominal cavity, maybe by the uh, uterine contents or maybe the external environment. The inverting sutures are applied, maybe Lambert or maybe Cushing in the uterus and then it's placed back after uh, just cleaning it properly and then uh, one can uh, sequentially close the layers of the peritoneum and separately and then the muscles and the skin at last. The post-operative care of the animal include uh, administration of antibiotics, anti-inflammatory and B complexes for a period of five to seven days as per the need and then administration of fluid replacements as per the need and uh, it is pertinent to tie a cloth around the, uh, around the abdomen so that uh, the incision site is protected from external contamination. The operative site must be cleaned daily with spirit and a nutritious and laxative diet should be provided to the animal. And uh, animals should, be, should not be allowed to run and sutures can be removed uh, 7 to uh, 10 days post-operative depending on the condition. The post-operative complication, the most, most common post-operative complication is peritonitis. And then there can be seroma formation, suture dehiscence, herniation, metritis, and anorexia. You see, often uh, if the animal does not start eating food after a surgery, if it does not eat food for 72 hours, it is for certain that animal has developed peritonitis. And the uh, prognosis is then very uh, doubtful. Uh, then suture dehiscence, uh, separation of the suture which you have applied uh, can cause contamination. Hernia can occur and uh, then a seroma formation. Uh, seroma formations are very usual in some animals but uh, they are uh, not very common in others. A, the, uh, then there had been a lot of debate on uh, the outcome of a cesarean section. Farmers often are of the view, once you get your animal operated, every time you will have to get it operated. It's not like that. And then they also have a view that once a animal is operated uh, by cesarean section, the future fertility is gone forever. It's not like that. It's the perioperative care which is very, very important. During the operation, after the operation. That is very important. If you care for the animal properly, then certainly 
the outcome would be much more better than if you don't care for the animal uh, the outcome would be uh, would be always be questionable so you can contact me uh, anytime at my email uh, which is mentioned over here and this is my linkedin account this is my youtube channel link you can contact me if uh, uh, i can be of any help to you uh, it would be a great pleasure for me and uh, thank you very much for your patient patient listening thank you thank you so much thank you sir uh, now we can go to the uh, chat session uh, there are lots of questions for you uh, you can stop the sharing and go to the chat okay as from uh, 645 onwards there are questions sir uh. yeah yeah uh. Uh, there is a, the first question is from dr samir how to manage vaginal prolapse in full term pregnant cow is it related to calcium deficiency or something else uh, dear uh, samir uh, the vaginal prolapse as i said earlier is uh, in a pregnant cow is related to the uh, reduction in the amniotic fluid if you give calcium the calcium may sometimes increase the motility and may predispose the animal to prolapse so as i said earlier that one can go in for applying a truss one can try some homeopathic treatments or even you can try for antioxidants maybe uh, vitamin a vitamin e vitamin c they they can be helpful but you uh, because there is plenty of pressure during pregnancy so you cannot guarantee that by using these drugs uh, the prolapse will not reoccur then uh, there is a question prolonged gestation can we expect normal fetal health owner says it's more than 10 months but per rectally affects live fetus and partial cervical dilation uh, you have rightly said that prolonged gestation it's <laughs> really very difficult for the clinician to predict the exact age of the fetus based simply on the palpation of the fetal head or maybe the fetal limb because the, and then even if you have a ultrasound the diagnosis is not not very precise so uh, uh, i don't think it, it sometimes so happens that you presume that there is a farmer's mistake and when the fetus is born you actually find based on the teeth of the fetus that yes what the farmer was saying is correct but you don't and the hair grows the uh, tooth of the fetus the hair the hoof you can say yes what the farmer was saying is correct but prolonged gestation for a clinician to predict per rectally is extremely extremely difficult then uh, uh termination of pregnancy with dose rate you see uh, a bovine pregnancy maybe the cattle maybe buffalo you can terminate any pregnancy from uh, during any time period except the very earlier days uh, say 5 days of pregnancy you cannot terminate using a prostaglandin but after day 5 you can terminate or you can prevent a pregnancy from day 5 onwards it is uh, from day uh, from 5 to 8 month of gestation because the receptors are less prevalent so you will have to combine prostaglandin along with corticosteroids and uh corticoid steroids have to be continued for 2 3 days then uh, <clears throat> what can be done to remove the in cases of fetal maceration uh maceration you see what you can do is you have to infuse normal saline inside you can use the cervical dilators as like soft supreme and then you can 
infuse normal saline and sometimes you have to put your hand inside if it is going inside and you have to manually catch hold of the fetal bones and take them out very very slowly it is it is uh, very uh, essential for the clinician to take care of his own health you see whenever you are dealing with a case of fetal maceration there may be uh, some microbes or some bacteria which can cause skin allergies to you or at home and uh, one must protect his own uh, hand very carefully <clears throat> then there is a new uh, question on the new zealand method of prolapse reduction if the animal is in, uh, uh, made to invert her hind legs are uh, lifted up so that the pressure uh, is less towards the vulvar lips that that is the new zealand method uh, sometimes in field what you can do is you we usually don't have those types of uh, facility so that we can lift the hind legs of the animal up so what you can do is you can take a uh, just ditch and made make the animal sit in that so that the fore legs are lower and the hind legs are upper that will reduce the pressure towards the vulvar lips so that you can replace it with uh, ease then uh, for uh, as far as the homeopathic drugs the uh, i have uh, used a lot of cpia and uh, that i think uh, is a very good approach but you can use all the four in combination that is no harm and uh, sometimes because you see homeopathy is a medicine homeopathic medicine is certainly different from our allopathic system of medication and it is very very difficult to decide the right medicine of homeopathy uh, it is even difficult in human beings so it's uh, still more difficult in animals but i have seen some cases which res uh, respond very well to cpia and they don't have a prolapse again then uh, best suture material best you see is the matter of availability and it's the matter of cost also one can use vicryl but it's very costly one can use catgut again uh, the suture material the place where you are placing a suture will decide what type of suture material you have to use and every suture material has got its own advantages its own disadvantages but using suture materials like vicryl is very costly so clinicians often avoid such type of uh, suture material yes uh, then pre and post cervical uterine torsion Uh, pre and post cervical uterine torsion are easy to be differentiated if you put your hand inside and the cervix is palpable and you can palpate the broad ligaments also then this is a pre cervical you are still able to make the cervix and uh, if it is post cervical then nothing like cervix will be palpable you can only feel the broad ligaments going down and the other side broad ligament uh, the nerve paralysis usually occurs with a hip lock condition and uh, nerve paralysis usually recover very very with great difficulty whether it is a simple nerve paralysis whether it is uh, uh, we can try with uh, this uh, b uh, the b complex group of uh, injections but uh, i don't know whether there could be some medicine homeopathic medicine for that uh, i haven't treated uh, or come across such type of cases but you, you can go in for cortical steroids you can use the uh, uh, nervine tonics then uh, intra cervical injection of prostaglandin yes 
intra cervical as i talk the uh, application of misoprostol or maybe any other uh, pge2 creams which have been used in humans in mares where there are no annular cervical rings they work very well but with cattle we used a lot of misoprostol gel with very little effect so uh, i don't think it would be of very very great help in uh, dilating the cervix i think i have addressed uh, if there are any more uh, i can just answer 